All right, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Sam Kim, and I'll be presenting key homomorphic pseudorandom functions from LWE with a small modulus. So the topic of this talk is on pseudorandom functions, so let's begin by discussing what these are. So we're all probably familiar with uh, this concept already. A pseudorandom function, or a PRF, is an efficiently computable deterministic function that has some associated key space, an input space, and an output space. So we say that a pseudorandom function is secure if no efficient adversary can distinguish an oracle access to the PRF for a randomly chosen key uh, to an oracle access to a completely randomly generated function. So pseudorandom functions are very useful objects in cryptography. Um, they are, of course, very fundamental objects in symmetric cryptography and can be used for symmetric encryption or max. Uh, so even beyond symmetric crypto, they are often incorporated into many cryptographic constructions and protocols. So when we need to generate like random bits, for instance, uh, PRFs are very useful. When we want to de-randomize a randomized algorithm, PRFs are also very, very useful in these settings. Uh, and so due to these uh, useful properties, so the random functions are widely studied in the literature today. So in terms of constructions, um, block ciphers such as AES are generally modeled as PRFs for analysis. Um, we can also construct provably secure PRFs from specific algebraic assumptions. Um, so using the classical result of Goldreich, Goldwasser, and Macaulay, uh, we know how to construct PRFs from any one-way functions. Uh, we also know how to construct PRFs from the DDH assumption by the result of Nauer and Reingold from 95. And we also know how to construct PRFs from the learning with errors assumptions, or LWE, from the result of Banerjee, Peckford, and Ro Rosen from 2012. So in this talk, uh, we will focus on uh, lattice-based PRFs. So in the world of lattices, there are two main families of PRF constructions. So first, there are constructions that follow the GGM construction with a lattice-based one-way function. So one-way functions based on hard problems like SIS or uh, LWE. So these constructions are very simple and quite elegant, which is a big plus. Um, at the same time, though, uh, these constructions are not the most completely efficient, and they also require evaluation circuits that are inherently sequential. This means that even if we had designated hardware devices for evaluating these PRFs, um, hardware acceleration will be somewhat limited, which is not ideal for objects like PRFs that are uh, very fundamental. Uh, the other family of PRF constructions from lattices are uh, direct constructions from LWE. So these PRFs generally have better concrete efficiency compared to PRFs that follow generically from one-way functions, and they also have shallow evaluation circuits. And even more, they have many useful algebraic structures like key homomorphism, which has a number of nice applications. So since uh, one of the results in this work is about key homomorphic PRFs, uh, let me define them in a little bit more detail. So the concept of key homomorphic PRFs was introduced by Nao et al. from 99 and was formalized by Bonnet et al. in 2013. So we say that a PRF uh, is key homomorphic if it satisfies the following properties. So first, we require that the key space and the output space form groups. So the key space and the output space don't necessarily have to be the same group, uh, but let me just denote uh, the group operations with additions uh, for this talk. So then we require that for any two keys, uh, K1 and K2, if we evaluate the PRF on the sum of these keys, uh, then this is equal to the sum of the PRF evaluation on each of these keys on the same input. So key homomorphic PRFs have many useful applications. Uh, so they give rise to you know, updatable encryption, proxy re-encryption, uh, distributed PRFs, and many others. So from LWE, um, we can directly construct pseudorandom functions that are efficient, have shallow evaluation circuits, and have useful algebraic structures like key homomorphism, which is very nice. However, all existing constructions of PRFs uh, in this family have one downside to them. Uh, so they all rely on LWE, where the size of the modulus must be super polynomially big with respect to the security parameter. Uh, to explain the issue with the modulus, uh, let me recall the LWE assumption. So the LWE assumption problem is parameterized by three parameters, uh, the, the dimension n, the modulus q, and a noise distribution that's usually denoted by a uh, chi. So in the LWE problem, our goal is to distinguish the following two distributions. So in the first distribution, we're given a set of uniformly sampled vectors, a1 through am, uh, in zq to the n, and its noisy inner product with a uniformly sampled LWE secret vector s. Uh, in the second distribution, we're provided with a set of uniformly sampled uh, vectors, a1 through am, and just uniformly random elements uh, in zq. So the LWE assumption states that these two distributions are computationally indistinguishable, so generally, for most applications, including PRFs, that rely on the LWE assumption, uh, it is always better to set the modulus Q to be as small as possible. So we always want Q to be small. Uh, so the first reason for this is related to efficiency. So generally, applications that rely on LWE uh, operate under the same ring, uh, ZQ. So as Q gets bigger, uh, the keys in these applications also become bigger, and so the operations also become uh, slower. 
And the second reason is related to the quality of the um, L2B assumption. So generally, the hardness of the L2B assumption is related to what is called the noise to modulus ratio. The greater the size of the modulus is compared to the size of the errors, um, the easier the L2B problem becomes. And so we want to set Q to be as small as possible to base our security on the hardest variant of the L2B assumption. So all non-GGM-based lattice PRFs uh, rely on L2B with Q that must scale super polynomially in the security parameter. So a natural open problem in this area has been whether we can construct an L2B-based PRF that relies on a polynomial size modulus Q. Uh, and this problem has actually been a, a big open problem in this area for quite a while, uh, ever since the first direct L2B-based PRF construction of Banerjee, Pikett, and Rosen from 2012. Uh, from 2012. Um, given the fact that we know how to construct seemingly more powerful prim primitives like polymorphic encryption or attribute-based encryption on L2B with only a polynomial size modulus Q, uh, the state of affairs has been even more puzzling that we cannot construct PRFs um, using a polynomial size a modulus Q. So let me summarize the main results of this work. Uh, so we provide two new PRF constructions that relies on uh, polynomial size modulus Q. So in the first construction, we focus on building a low depth PRF. So we construct a new PRF that can be evaluated by circuits in NC2 and works over polynomial size modulus Q. So in our second PRF construction, we focus on key homomorphism. So we build a PRF that has high depth evaluation circuits, but is key homomorphic and works over a polynomial size Q. So both of our constructions can be extended to the ring setting as well uh, for better efficiency. So the security of these constructions can be based on the on the ring LWE um, as opposed to LWE. Um, and I think the main uh, the most interesting part of this work is actually not on the final result of our paper, but actually the technique that we use. So both of our PRF constructions use a technique called chaining, which I will talk about later on in the talk. I think chaining can have more applications even beyond uh, the context of PRFs. So in the remainder of the talk, uh, let me give an overview of our PRF constructions and explain what this chaining technique is. Uh, but before I get started, uh, let me briefly comment on the limitation of our first PRF construction, the low depth of PRF that we construct. Uh, so in order to prove that our construction is secure, we provide a reduction from LWE. So any adversary that can break our PRF can be translated into an attacker that breaks the LWE assumption. However, the success probability of our reduction will be quite low, so it will be barely noticeable when the modulus Q is set to be a polynomial in the security parameter. So more precisely, what we get is basically a trade-off between the loss in our security reduction and the size of the modulus Q. So the bigger the Q is, uh, the better the small, uh, the better or the smaller the reduction loss becomes. So as entirely speaking, the parameter settings that we achieve uh, for our first PRF construction is not much better than any uh, GGM-based uh, lattice PRF. Uh, but when we consider the concrete efficiency of our PRF, uh, it will be much better than a GGM-based PRF. So I will uh, refer to our paper for the full discussion on this uh, issue with reduction loss. And let me move on to uh, describing an overview. Uh, let me move on to giving an overview of our PRF construction. All right, uh, the main intermediate abstraction that we're going to use to construct our PRF uh, is a special family of pseudorandom generators um, called pseudorandom synthesizers which is a concept that was introduced by Nauer and Reingold from 95. So a pseudo-random synthesizer that we will denote by S in this talk uh, is, a is a deterministic uh, two-to-one function that takes in a pair of elements from some domain D and outputs a single element in the same domain. So one can think of this as a compressing function that compresses two elements into just a single element. So we say that a pseudo-random synthesizer is secure if for any polynomial M, uh, if we sample 2m uniformly random elements, a1 through am, and b1 through bm, and apply the synthesizer to each pair of ais and bis, then the result is computationally indistinguishable from m squared uh, independent uniformly random elements uh, in the same domain. So a pseudo-random synthesizer is basically a PRG that allows, that allows us to take 2m elements uh, in the domain as a seed and expand it into m squared elements in the domain. All right. So Anaur and Rheingold showed that if we have a secure pseudorandom synthesizer, then we can construct a low-depth PRF as follows. So suppose that we want to construct an n-bit PRF, where n is a power of two integer. Uh, then the PRF key is going to consist of two n uh, random elements from the domain of the synthesizer. And so let's denote these elements as a10 uh, all the way through a n0, and then a11 all the way through uh, a n1. Okay. Uh, then we're going to define the PRF evaluation on an input x uh, using a tree structure as follows. 
So each leaf of the tree is going to be associated with a pair of elements in our key uh, that are associated with each bit of our PRF input. So the first uh, leaf position is going to be associated with um, A10 and A11. And the second uh, bit leaf position will be associated with uh, A20 and A21 and so on. Okay, and then to evaluate the PRF on a specific input, uh, x, we will take either um, a10 or a11, uh, depending on the first bit of our input, and we will take either a20 or a21, depending on our second uh, bit of our input, uh, and so on. And then we will apply the synthesizer to each pair of, the, of these elements uh, one by one. Okay, so at each level of the tree, we're basically compressing our elements into a uh, half, and eventually, we will land on a single element in the domain, which is going to be our final PRF output. Um, we can argue about the security of this PRF uh, recursively. So it can be readily checked that at level 1 of the tree, uh, each synthesizer is basically a secure 2-bit PRF, uh, simply by the definition of a secure synthesizer. So in this example, the left synthesizer is a secure 2-bit PRF, uh, the, and the right synthes uh, synthesizer is a secure 2-bit PRF, uh, and this means that if you apply the synthesizer on the combined outputs of these two synthesizers, then the result is indistinguishable from an output of a secure 4-bit uh, PRF. So we can continue this argument to show that the entire construction uh, is a secure PRF. So in order to construct a synthesizer from the LW assumption, uh, we must figure out a way of generating errors in some deterministic fashion. Uh, so the work of Banerjee, Pike, and Rosen from 2012 showed a way to do this in an elegant way. So instead of adding noise uh, to the product of vectors or matrices, uh, A times S, uh, we will instead map them into some small subsets or buckets in ZQ. So here's a, a picture example of Z mod 24. And so if the inner product, uh, AS, uh, lands in this blue subspace, then we're going to assign the value 0 uh, to the inner product. Uh, if it lands in this green subspace, then we're going to assign the value 1 uh, to the inner product, uh, and, and so on. If it lands in the red, then we're going to assign the value 2. So this way, we're rounding a value in Z24 to an assigned partition in the, sub, in the space uh, that is represented by the subgroup of Z mod 3 in this example. Okay. So in algebraic form, uh, we do this operation by the uh, rounding notation. Uh, so we're basically mapping elements in ZQ to elements in uh, Z mod P. So uh, intuitively, uh, when we add some noise uh, to the inner product of AS, uh, then we're basically masking the lower order bits of the result uh, with this noise. So basically what rounding is doing here is it's basically just completely removing the lower order bits uh, from the result. So intuitively this rounding and this adding noise has uh, basically the same effect of completely masking the lower order bits uh, from an adversary. So uh, given this intuition, uh, Banerjee et al. Uh, introduced a new computational assumption called the learning with rounding assumption, uh, which is parameterized by n and q as in LWE, uh, but instead of the noise distribution, uh, it has an associated modulus p. So the LWR assumption states that for uniformly random public matrices A1 through AM uh, and secret matrix S, uh, the rounding of the matrix products uh, AI times S, so here we're applying the rounding operation uh, component-wise, uh, then this distribution is computationally indistinguishable from the rounding of uniformly random matrices. So using the LWR assumption, then it is now straightforward to construct a natural uh, synthesizer that takes in two matrices, uh, A and S, uh, multiplies these two matrices, and then round the result down. So uh, it is straightforward to show that the synthesizer is indeed secure uh, from the LWR assumption. And here, the synthesizer only consists of matrix multiplication and rounding operation. And so the synthesizer can be computed by a low-depth search. Uh, there is a slight technicality here uh, with the domain of the, of the synthesizer. So the synthesizer takes in a square, uh, square matrices from uh, ZQ uh, and maps them into square matrices in ZP. Um, so the, the, the domain of the synthesizer and the range of the synthesizer is actually different, uh, but this is really a minor technicality uh, that can be fixed in a number of ways, and I will just refer to the paper for more details on how we can actually do that. All right, so we now know that number one, a secure pseudorandom synthesizer uh, gives us a low depth of PRF construction. And number two, uh, the LWR assumption gives us a secure pseudorandom synthesizer. So the remaining question is whether the LWR assumption can be shown to hold assuming that the LWE assumption holds. Uh, Banerjee et al. Um, showed, uh, showed that this is indeed the case uh, via a hybrid argument. So we want to show that given uniformly random matrices, AIs, and the rounded matrix products of AIs and S, uh, the resulting distribution is computationally indistinguishable from a bunch of uniformly random uh, matrices. So as an intermediate hybrid distribution, uh, we're going to introduce a distribution that provides the product of AIs with S, 
but with both noise and rounding applied to it. So it provides ai times s plus some noise, and then uh, round the result. Uh, if the rounding modulus q is sufficiently greater than the rounding modulus p, then with overwhelming probability, we can show that the added noise uh, goes away uh, with the rounding. The intuition is that if we round away enough lower bits from the output, then, so, then some small noise in the lower bits uh, do not really impact the final output. So these two, these two distributions are statistically indistinguishable. Uh, so once we have this statistical indistinguishability, um, we can show that the hybrid distribution is computationally indistinguishable from a uniform distribution. Uh, this follows just straightforwardly from the LWR assumption. Okay? And this is how we basically show that the LWR assumption holds as long as the LWR assumption holds. However, the apparent limitation of this reduction is the requirement that the modulus Q must be much greater than the rounding modulus P. So uh, roughly speaking, uh, we can show that for uniformly random matrices, uh, A and S, uh, the probability that the rounding of A times S uh, is equal to A times S plus some noise E is roughly P over Q uh, multiplied by the size of the noise E. So this means that even if we set the, the noise uh, and the value of P to be very, very small, uh, Q has to be super polynomially greater than these values for this equality to hold with overwhelming probability. So this is where our new idea of chaining comes in. As a thought experiment, uh, let's modify the LW distribution in some funny way. Uh, so this distribution is going to be defined with respect to some positive integer, tau, uh, which we will call the chaining parameter. Uh, we're also going to make use of an explicit error sampler, or a Gaussian sampler, that takes in a uniform seed r and deterministically produces a noise matrix E. Uh, then we're going to define an oracle that we will refer to as the hybrid oracle, uh, as follows. So the hybrid oracle will take in a uniformly random uh, square matrix A and a set of uniformly random square matrices uh, S1 through S tau. Then it will produce the following distribution. So first, uh, it will output the uh, so first it will sample a noise matrix uh, E1 from the noise distribution and then compute the matrix A times S1 plus E1 uh, as in an L2B sample. Then uh, it will round the result down uh, and feed it into the error sampler to generate the noise for the next iteration of the chain E2. Next, it will move on to uh, compute the next iteration of the chain. So it will compute uh, A times S2 plus E2, uh, round the result down, and use the result as a C to generate the, the error uh, E3 for the next uh, iteration of the chain. So it will basically continue on this procedure for tau iterations. And in the, ta in the tau iteration, uh, it will just return the seed of the result. So what we're basically doing is chaining multiple LW distributions uh, with multiple keys together and deriving a new distribution uh, from it. So it is actually not too hard to show that the output distribution of this oracle is computationally indistinguishable from uniform. So by the LW assumption, uh, we can first show that the first iteration of uh, AS1 plus E1 is indistinguishable from uniform uh, by, the, by the LW assumption. Uh, so this implies that R1 uh, is uniformly dis uh, distributed, meaning that E2 is also properly distributed a noise matrix. So uh, this in turn implies that the second iteration of AS2 plus E2 uh, is computationally um, indistinguishable from uniform by LWE. And we can basically repeat this process for the entire chain uh, to show uh, that the final output is uniformly random. OK, so this is all nice and fine, but why are we even defining this oracle in this fashion? Uh, this oracle is still a randomized oracle that must sample the noise matrix E1 uh, in a randomized way. So it doesn't really appear to help in building a deterministic uh, synthesizer. Uh, but the key observation that we make uh, is that even if this initial noise matrix, uh, E1, uh, is said to be zero, uh, the pseudo-randomness of this oracle distribution is still uh, preserved. So to see this, uh, let's define another oracle that we'll refer to as the LWE or LWRE oracle. Uh, so this LWRE oracle works in exactly the same way as the hybrid oracle that we defined previously. Uh, the only difference uh, is going to be that this first noise uh, matrix, uh, E1, uh, we're just going to set this to be a zero matrix. So, uh, so in the first chain, the oracle computes uh, A times S1 um, plus zero, so plus zero, uh, and derive a seed uh, for E2 by rounding this result down. Uh, that's it. So everything else uh, stays the same. So the first chain here, uh, the rounding of A times S1, it's basically an LWR sample. So we're, so we're essentially chaining an LWR sample with a bunch of LWE samples. And so this is why we refer to this oracle as the LWRE oracle, uh, which stands for a learning with rounding and errors oracle. 
So we can actually show that the distribution produced by the hybrid oracle uh, is, is actually statistically indistinguishable from the L2P oracle, even when the modulus Q is said to be small. So recall that uh, the probability that the rounding of the exact product of two uniformly random matrices, A and S, uh, is equal to the rounding of their noisy product, um, A, S plus E, uh, is roughly proportional to the size of the noise times P over Q. So let's say that we set the modulus Q to be just big enough so that this product is roughly uh, one half. Okay. So uh, then we can actually uh, make the following observation. At each iteration of the chain uh, in the hybrid and LWRE distributions, um, the probability that the Cs that we use to derive the noise matrices, so these um, Ris, are, are equal, is going to be 1 over 2. So no matter what noise matrix that we get uh, from the previous um, iteration, um, the probability that A times S i uh, plus noise will coincide in the two distributions is basically 1 over 2. By the way, we set the modulus Q. Uh, next, we note that if at least one of the results of the chain in the two distributions produce the same seed Ris, uh, then for all the sequent iterations of the chain, the seeds will coincide in the two distributions. And this is just because um, the Gaussian sampler, the error sampler, is deterministic. So there is basically one over two chance that the seed will be different in any iteration of the chain, uh, but, if there is, um, but if there is one chain for which the, the seed is the same, then all the sequent iteration will produce exactly the same result. So this means that the probability that the output of these two oracles will differ on any given input will be at most uh, 1 over 2 to the tau. So for tau that is super logarithmic, uh, this probability is basically negligible. All right, so this LWRE oracle uh, induces a natural computational problem that we call the learning with rounding and errors problem. So it basically asks an adversary to distinguish the outputs of the LWRE oracle with those of a uniform sampler. So uh, using the same argument that we discussed in the previous slide, uh, we can show that the LWRE problem is hard assuming that the LWE assumption holds. So for this, uh, we can consider the intermediate distribution uh, that provides the output of the randomized hybrid oracle uh, from the previous slide. So uh, we showed that as long as the um, parameter tau is big enough compared to the modulus Q, uh, the outputs of the LWRE oracle and those of the hybrid oracle are statistically indistinguishable. Uh, then, uh, via a standard hybrid argument, uh, we, can use the LWE, we can use LWE to switch each output of the hybrid oracle to uniformly random uh, values, to uniformly random uh, outputs. So then, uh, using the LWRE assumption, we can naturally construct a synthesizer in a straightforward way. So the synthesizer takes in a matrix A and a set of matrices uh, S1 through S tau and return the output of the LW oracle on these inputs. So the security of the synthesizer follows very straightforwardly uh, from the hardness of the LWRE problem. Uh, and basically the PRF that is implied by the synthesizer is our final uh, low depth PRF. So here, um, there is actually a domain mismatch. Um, so the synthesizer takes in a single square matrix A and tau matrices S1 through S tau, uh, just to produce a single square matrix in ZQ. So this domain mismatch is a slight technicality that can be addressed pretty easily uh, in multiple ways. And so I will just refer to the paper for the details on how we can do that. So one thing to note here uh, is that the depth of the synthesizer is basically determined by the chaining parameter tau for the LWRE problem. So uh, this is where our trade-off between the depth of the PRF and the size of the modulus comes in. So if tau is large, then we can set Q to be very small and still have a tight reduction. So if Q is a little bit larger, then we can uh, set tau to be uh, much smaller and get a very low uh, depth PRF. All right, so I think my time is almost up. So let me just briefly comment on our second PRF construction. Uh, so we achieve our second PRF, uh, which is key homomorphic, by applying the chaining tech technique on top of already existing uh, key homomorphic PRFs. So chaining existing key homomorphic PRFs uh, allows us to prove their security with much better uh, parameter settings. So in particular, um, if we chain the key homomorphic PRF of Banerjee and Pikert from 2014, uh, then we can get a key homomorphic PRF whose security can be based uh, entirely on LWE with the polynomial size modulus of Q. So I will refer to the paper for the full details on how we can do this. All right, so um, let me wrap up with some open problems. So the first nice open uh, problem is whether we can construct a low depth PRF uh, without the undesirable um, loss in the security reduction. So can we have can we construct a PRF that can be evaluated by a circuit of polylogarithmic depth and then still have a, of a tight uh, security reduction? So I think this is a very nice open problem. 
Um, also, um, can we construct PRFs with additional algebraic properties using just the uh, LW with the polynomial size Q? So for instance, can we use a chaining to base the security of existing constraint PRFs on LW with polynomial uh, modulus Q? And finally, um, the method of chaining may have additional applications outside the world of PRFs, uh, so it would be interesting to find other applications where chaining may be useful. Okay, and with that, uh, let me conclude. Thank you very much.